Hello, and welcome to the Indie Beginning Podcast, where we bring story lovers wonderful tales created by independently published authors. It is our mission to help indie authors grow through dialogue created by the reviews you leave, as well as bi-weekly unique topic segments. Did you know that there is a place not far from where you live where you can solve crimes, save lives, travel to distant planets, and meet new life? A place where you can fight a dragon, become whoever you ever dreamed of being, all while learning how to prepare a turducken? This week's episode is brought to you by your local library. Turn off your television, unplug your PS4, and set down your phone for just a couple hours a week and get lost in a book. And when you're done, turn that phone back on and subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts or Google Play. And let us know if you're enjoying the show by leaving a review. This week, Indie Beginning introduces readers to the science fiction novel Ark of Souls, book one of the Veil series, by indie author Paul Grover. On the outer frontier, the FSS Berlin, an aging federal Navy cruiser, disrupts a pirate attack on a corporate freighter. Mira Thorne, an emotionally damaged veteran of the Martian War of Independence, is dispatched to investigate the heavily damaged vessel. The broken ship becomes Mira and her companion's only hope of survival, as events spiral out of control. Paul Grover was one of the first people to submit to the Indie Beginning podcast, and has been a great support ever since. Ark of Souls was originally set to air back in February, but Paul allowed us to push his story back so that we could teach ourselves how to add sound effects to a story. We can't thank him enough for trusting us with his work. And now sit back, close your eyes, and get lost in the beginning of Ark of Souls. The FSS Berlin exited hyperspace in a discharge of exotic energy and white light. Her braking thrusters fired to stabilize her forward velocity as she broke free from the facet and light envelope. Her sudden arrival scattered the pirate squadron, driving them away from their target, a long-range hauler in corporate colors. The Berlin's forward turrets targeted and fired at the aggressors. Three of the fighters exploded in quick succession. One survivor was caught in the blast. Its ion engines flamed out and the ship tumbled into the void. The remaining pair built hyperspatial envelopes and engaged their faster-than-light drives. The warship's turrets retracted as she matched the relative velocity of the stricken cargo vessel. Berlin was an older ship, one of the last three Europa-class vessels in the fleet service, and like her sisters, she was seeing out the twilight of her career patrolling the outer edges of human space. In spite of her immense size, her crew accommodation had been a secondary design consideration to housing her propulsion and weapon systems. Officers' cabins were no exception. They were small enough to be cramped and borderline uncomfortable, yet large enough to allow for crucial equipment to be lost. Mira had started to lose a lot of things. She hoped it was not a sign of further short-term memory degradation, preferring instead to blame the clutter of her cabin for her inability to keep track of her belongings. It was an easy comfortable delusion. She rummaged through the pile of discarded clothing on her bunk before dropping to the floor and peering into the dark, dusty space beneath. She located the bleeping comlink, laying between an illicit stash of painkilling meds and a pink rabbit. She keyed the tiny in-ear device to receive the call. Thorn, Commander Central Ops. Susan Walton, the ship's executive officer, made no mention of the delay in Mira's response. We are conducting an anti-piracy operation and have intercepted a vessel in distress. We have dealt with the insurgents and the sector is secure. The captain has assigned you to lead the inspection team. Mira sighed. Inspections were a tedious reality of deep space patrol. Most of the time they were fruitless searches through cargo holds and squalid ships while equally grubby crew looked on. Understood, Mira replied, slipping an eye patch over her left eye socket with a fluid practice motion. She checked it was in place by touch, her fingers lingering on the scars that ran like roadmaps over the side of her face. She shook her head and her still damp raven hair fell forward, the non-regulation style obscuring the worst of the damaged tissue. What type of vessel is it, Sue? she asked. Corporate. It's a Kobo. Registered to Lightfoot Developments. We can't raise the pilot and the ship has sustained severe damage. Captain Adams will brief you before you leave. He is waiting in Bay 3. Corporation vessels were always preferred to independence as they usually complied with government hygiene and safety standards. When do I go? Captain wants to launch in 15. Roger. Understood. Thorn out. And I was hoping for an easy day, she thought. Instead of the calm, predictable quiet of the flight deck, 
She was sent to spend the next eight hours rummaging through the hold of a freighter that could be carrying anything from manufactured goods to bio-waste. This was Mira's first inspection in three months, and she had to admit it was probably overdue. She smiled as she recalled being pulled from the last one due to a minor medical issue and how Alex Kite had been sent in her stead. He had contracted a skin infection so severe he had been confined to medbay for three weeks. While the rest of the crew had enjoyed a week of leave at the Proxima Anchorage, Kite had spent his downtime in the ISO booth. Kite was an academy golden boy, was straight first in every discipline. He should have had her job, and he would have if she had not been assigned to the ship's crew two years ago. Mira had no doubt Kite resented her, yet she tolerated his passive-aggressive snipes and his thinly disguised put-downs. He was both the very best and the very worst the Academy could produce. Mira understood his ill feelings. He was a gifted officer with a bright future, while she was a broken dropship pilot who only held on to her commission by virtue of her combat record. It didn't take two eyes to see respective careers were going in different directions. She unzipped her fatigues and kicked off her boots tossing them to one side, adding them to the chaos of her cabin. She shivered in just her underwear and danced from one bare foot to the other. Mira opened the gear locker at the foot of her narrow bunk and removed the base layer of her battle suit. She pulled the heavy dark blue garment up over her lower body before wriggling her arms and shoulders into it. Once it was secure, she pulled her tactical webbing over her shoulders and fastened her body armor to it. She double-checked the catches and powered up the electronics. Now sweating, she welcomed the suit's cooling circuit kicking into action. She retrieved her helmet. Putting it on as she ran a system check before removing it and attaching it to a utility loop on her webbing. Satisfied that the suit was operating correctly, she checked her sidearm and holstered it on her hip. She looked around the cabin and promised to tidy up when she returned. It may be small, but it was home. A faded Union Jack and Namibian flag adorned the bulkhead above her bunk. Below them, a mosaic of two- and three-dimensional photographs. Friends, family, places she had been, and ships she had flown. Thirty years of memory clinging to the wall of an aging cruiser at the edge of humanity's realm. She walked to the vibrant, haphazard collage and removed a crumpled two-dimensional picture of a young woman standing on the Seattle waterfront. The girl with tan skin and brown eyes smiled a smile devoid of cares. She placed the photo in her utility pocket. Mira turned on her heel and left the cabin, her personal mask falling into place. The Berlin's corridors were lit by dim red light emanating from concealed panels. The ship was in her night cycle. Combat vessels operated at full state of readiness at all times, yet still maintained the practice of delineating time into day and night. Navy studies had found that it enhanced the mental well-being of the crew. The Navy operated on Greenwich Mean Time. Every ship and station was operating the same procedures at the exact moment, no matter where they were in the galaxy. Mira checked the time on her wrist-mounted combat computer. It was just before 2 a.m. She walked past the bank of elevators and ducked into the stairwell leading into the hangar deck. It was a roundabout route, but the movement would loosen her taut muscles, and the kinetic energy she generated provided a boost to the charge in her suit's battery pack. After six flights of steps, she cut through the engineering section. The roar of superheated plasma flowing through overhead pipework was deafening. The reactor was the heart of the ship. Those pipes were her arteries, the pulsing vibration of the deck beneath Mirror's boots, her heartbeat. Old ships like Berlin were almost alive. Their unique quirks and personality known to their crew and passed on generation to generation. These great lumps of metal were as much a vibrant organism as the humans who rode aboard them. Mira had only been in the Berlin for two patrols, yet she understood the affection long-serving crew members felt for the old bee. She arrived at Bay 3 in a more upbeat mood than she had expected. A Marine at the guard station saluted and waved her through. She smiled and returned the salute. It seemed to Mira that the higher rank one attained, the more salutes it garnered. She had every respect for the Navy's traditions, but she found the constant formality increasingly tedious. A tug was preparing for launch a low rumble coming from its star drive while faint jets of vapor vented from the vessel's cooling system. The ugly craft comprised a boxy fuselage with a pair of Honda XF450 ion engines attached by a network of aluminum struts. Berlin carried three tugs. This one bore the number two and worn, pitted red paint on its stubby nose. 
Captain Marcus Adams stood at the front of the entry ramp, talking with a pair of Marines. Their battle armor dark olive compared to the blue of Mira's suit. Gunnery Sergeant Rich Barnes, a giant of a man with a swagger earned from a lifetime service, shared a joke with Adams. They both laughed at the punchline. A second jar had stood behind Barnes. Mira could not remember his name. He was one of the new guys. A head shorter than Barnes, he still towered over Mira, who barely met the Navy's minimum height requirement. Gunny Barnes nodded to her and concluded his conversation with the captain. Both Marines made their way up the ramp and disappeared into the tug. Commander Thorne, you are looking like a boss today, Adam said with a smile. It suits you. We should get you off the ship more often. Don't try too hard, Captain. You know my position on inspections. What can I look forward to? It was a straightforward interception. We detected an attack at the edge of our sensor range. Six pirates against one freighter. We took out three fighters. Two bugged out. One is disabled. Roland will be recovering it while you poke around on the target vessel. What's he carrying, she asked. Captain Adams shrugged. We haven't been able to raise anybody on board. The ship is in a bad way. I suspect that the communication system is down. Or the crew are dead, she added. Or that. In which case, I'll send Dr. Garrett with a specialist team. Understood. How long have I got? As long as you need. It will be a minimum of an hour to recover and secure the pirate vessel, so take your time. Enjoy yourself. Oh, I'll have a ball, she said. It came out more sourly than she intended. One more thing, Mira. Adams moved closer and dipped his head. I received your most recent psych assessment yesterday. You have made significant progress since you came on board. I want you to know how pleased I am. If there is anything you need, you know where I am, okay? Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. She tried her best to sound sincere. Mira figured she was either the ship's screwball or a sympathy case. Which one depended on who you asked? As far as Captain Adams was concerned, she believed he was probably in the latter group, which was almost certainly the minority. She looked up at him and locked his steel gray eyes with her soul green one. I mean it, Captain. Your support means a lot to me. Mira had to admit she was feeling better than she had in a long time. Aside for the odd memory lapse, she was convinced that the tide was starting to turn for her. Adam studied her for a moment. He straightened up. Seemingly satisfied by what he saw, he smiled. Adams was one of the old school. He treated his crew like his extended family. Good hunting, Thorn. Try to smile. You're the face of the Navy after all. Mira turned away and marched up the ramp. She stopped at the top, snapped off a salute, and a genuine smile before the hatch slid closed. Face of the Navy, she thought. My mug is hardly going to make it into a recruiting fit anytime soon. Barnes and the new guy were already in their seats. As she passed, she glanced at the man's name stenciled on his armor. PFC Ethan Tate. A stylized spanner and a clenched fist indicated that he was a combat engineer. Mira strapped herself in opposite of the Marines. Barnes was checking his weapon over. The name Babs was stenciled in red ink on the side of the barrel. Are you still naming your weapons, Gunny? Mira asked. Only the ones with personality. Otherwise people will get the wrong idea, he replied. His face serious. He pulled out his other sidearm. You've met Babs. This is Carol. He flipped it so they could both see the name on the butt. Private Tate looked uncertainly at Barnes. Babs is his ex-wife, Private, Mira explained. Barnes grinned. A fine woman who I loved most dearly. And Carol? Tate asked. She's the reason why she's his ex-wife, Mira replied. Another fine woman who I loved most dearly. Barnes laughed as the tug lifted off the deck and exited the landing bay. Mira closed her eyes and rested her head against the bulkhead. She could feel a growing headache. The pain was focused and drilled through her skull. She reached into her armor for two white pills and popped them under her tongue. She fought back the gag reflex and dry-swallowed them. They took the edge off the pain, but did not banish it. Today was going to be a long day. They covered the nine kilometers from the Berlin to the stranded ship in two minutes. As they approached, Mira made her way forward to the cramped cockpit and peered through the windows. The pilot pointed to scorch marks on the light gray hull. Looks like they landed some good hits after they burned the shields away, he said, without taking his eyes off the ship. The hull damage was severe, but Mira was more concerned by the plasma leaking from one of the ion engines. It's messy, she observed. They must have hit that with some high-wattage weapons. Military-grade kit by the looks of it. 
It's only a thin skin hull. Solid ordnance would have torn through it in no time. He was lucky, the pilot added. Can you spin us around, Roland? Mira asked. The pilot nodded and rotated the tug on its central axis while continuing with forward velocity. The logo on the Kobo's and Hedril tailfin was different to the standard Lightfoot developments motif. This one featured the usual single planet orbiting a stylized star. It carried the tagline, Building the Future, Learning from the Past. He's attached to their astroarchaeological division, Mira said. Astroarch was a smokescreen, the corporations used for acquiring non-human technologies. Universities and museums were fed a stream of religious and cultural relics, while the megacorps skimmed off the high-tech finds for commercial advantage. He had a lucky escape. Six fighters and eight or so hits. That's pretty poor for the Blades. Blades? I thought Rhodes was out of the piracy business. An organized fight with high-powered weapons? It has all the hallmarks of one of Rhodes' operations, Mira said. Continuing to study the crippled ship, Roland nodded. It looks professional. They were targeting the sublights and the shield generator. Roland pointed out the window with a gloved hand. Look! The damage was worse than she first thought. Sparks and vapor escaped into the vacuum from numerous ruptured pipes. Xander Rhodes and the Blades had always been a potent threat on the frontier. They were certainly able to match Navy pilots against larger targets. Although Mira had to admit she had heard little of the Blades in recent years. Take us in on the top airlock, Roland. Mira floated back to the crew cabin. There was a muffled metallic thunk as the tug made connection with the Kobo. Barnes and Tate released their harnesses and floated out of their seats. In single file with Mira leading, they propelled themselves to the lower airlock. Mira cycled the controls to pressurize the lock, before hitting the hatch release. She put on her helmet and activated the camera. Both marines followed her lead. The connecting tube between the vessels were three meters long. The hatch at the other end opened to reveal a featureless steel-gray airlock cubicle. Want me to go in first, Barnes asked. Mira shook her head. Nah, I got this. She swiveled to enter the airlock feet first. Unlike the tug, the target ship would be operating an artificial gravity field, and landing on her head was a rookie mistake she had no intention of making. Passing through the second hatch and into the Kobo, her feet connected firmly with the rungs of the entry ladder. She experienced the familiar sickening lurch in her stomach as she traversed from free fall to normal gravity. She drew her sidearm and waited for Barnes and Tate to climb down. Once the airlock was sealed, she contacted the tug pilot who silently disengaged from the vessel. Mira nodded to Barnes, who with Tate, covered the hatchway into the ship. Mira operated the latch and the inner door irised open. A blast of warm, humid air filled the airlock. She wrinkled her nose. The smell of burnt wiring and melted components was pungent. Beyond the airlock, the ship was dimly lit with flickering emergency lighting. A faint blue mist hung in the air. She shuddered. The atmosphere was oppressive, the air heavy and charged. She tried to shake the feeling off, yet it lingered before fading into the back of her mind. The reactor must be offline. The air scrubbers are not working, Barnes said. Mirror refocused. They stepped out of the airlock and into the ship's main corridor. The flight deck lay to her right and the habitation section to her left. Mira coughed. (coughs) The acrid fumes catching the back of her throat. Her eye watered, and she blinked it clear. Hello? She called once she caught her breath. Is anyone home? Barnes yelled from behind her. His deep voice echoed off the steel walls of the ship. I guess not, Mira said, when no answer was forthcoming. If the ship were abandoned, they would have to secure the vessel, alert the owners, and attach a tracking beacon to the hull. If they found any bodies... Then they would need to gather a catalog of evidence for a potential criminal investigation, regardless of how slim the chances were of bringing the perpetrators to justice. Gunny, I want you to go aft. Check the habitation section. She looked at the other Marine. She couldn't remember his name. Alan? Edward? No, it was Ethan. Definitely Ethan. Ethan, I want you to come forward. We'll try to break into the flight log. Yes, ma'am, he replied. What about the lower deck, Barnes asked. The standard configuration for a Kobo was a twin-deck freighter. The upper section contained the crew quarters, the lower devoted to cargo space and engineering sections. Let's secure this section before we go below, Mira said. Barnes hefted his weapon and moved aft, whistling tunelessly. Mira looked at Tate. After you, Private, 
she said. They walked to the flight deck in silence, the thick carpet and padded walls absorbing the sound of their movement. It's very well appointed for a hauler, more like a starliner than a freighter, Tate said. Mira glanced around her. He was right. The carpet was deep blue and flecked with gold stars, the walls textured with decorative padding. I'll take your word for it, Private. I'm on a Navy salary after all. Tate looked uncertain, like he'd spoken out of turn. No, I mean, I was just... His voice trailed off when he picked up on Mira's failed attempt at humor. They lapsed back into silence. As they approached the flight deck, the luxury gave way to a more utilitarian style of decor. Rubberized flooring replaced the carpet, and the walls were bare painted steel. The flight deck was well equipped, yet small, and continued the stripped down aesthetic. The pilot and co pilot's chairs were positioned in a tight hollow in front of the curved viewport. Touchscreen displays and banks of switches surrounded each station. Mira moved forward and gazed into the void. The Berlin was visible just off the starboard bow. Her outline was picked out in dots and dashes of light from her windows, while powerful spotlights illuminated her steel-gray hull. She felt homesick and lonely as she stared at the isolated island of humanity light years from Earth. It was quite out of keeping and not unwelcome. It occurred to her that reconnecting to the human race could be a real possibility. She recalled something that her therapist had said to her at their first meeting. The journey would be one of small steps. You won't realize you have reached your destination until the day you have arrived. She was beginning to see the wisdom in that bald, bug-eyed Sykes' words. Her demons were a long way behind her. But she knew she had to keep taking those small steps, lest they catch up and consume her. No one is home, Tate said. His voice pulled Mirror back into the now. She shook off the low melancholy that had momentarily fallen over her. She looked around the deck. Not only was it deserted, it showed no signs of life. There was none of the detritus usually found on the flight deck for a long-range hauler. No empty mugs or half-eaten snacks were stashed between the equipment. There were none of the trinkets and charms that made space more human. Not so much as a photograph pinned to a console. Either no one had been on deck or they suffered from extreme OCD. If anyone was on board, I would have expected them to be here, Mira said. It was deeply padded and the seat bolsters firmly gripped her body. Perks of the private sector, she said absently. She tapped into the ship's main computer and pulled up the recent log entries in itinerary. He left Tellerman Gateway a week ago en route for Tarantella. The pirate system? Tate asked. Mira continued to drill into the database. A bit harsh, she said. It's lawless and not what you'd call on the grid, but it's still a legitimate outpost. At the moment, anyway. The legal status of Tarantella was a subject of debate. The station in the system it occupied was not affiliated with the Federation, but a free trade agreement was in place between the Federation and the station's trade guild. Technically, Tarantella was subject to federal law, but the lack of an official federal presence in the station allowed it complete autonomy. In recent years, the authorities had ignored the outpost, preferring to concentrate on expanding the frontier rather than bringing the system under full governance. It made sense to Mira. If the government came down hard on Tarantella, they would be forced to act against countless other rogue outposts occupying the inner and outer frontiers. A bright flash illuminated the flight deck. She turned to see Tate grinning, his hands inside his inspection hatch. That should do it, he said. A moment later, lights came on, and Mira heard the faint hum of the air scrubbers kicking into life. Nice work, Private. Mira continued to read through the system logs. They seemed fairly straightforward, aside from the fact that they contained no human interaction. Then she spotted it. The ship has been on an automated flight path since it left Tellerman. The program was uploaded to the Navicom remotely, she said. She keyed her comlink. Rich, have you found anyone? There was a pause. Negative, Mira. The upper deck is deserted. This isn't a standard freighter, either. With this amount of finery, it's my bet this was an executive transport of some sort. Do you want me to go below? Not yet. I want to talk to the captain. Something isn't right. She closed the link and changed the channel. Berlin. Thorn. She waited for a reply. Sunops, go ahead, Mira, Sue Walton answered. It looks like we have a ghost ship. The upper deck is deserted, and the logs indicate that the ship left from Tellerman, and has been on auto ever since. I'm going to check out the cargo space, but the ship is pretty beaten up. The drive core is offline, and I think the subluts are fu- non-functional. 
I recommend we bring her on board. There was a pause. The captain came online. Mira, if we bring her on board, we'll have to divert. She didn't know how quite to put it. Captain, nothing adds up. And the ship was on an automated course for Tarantella. A pause. I see. Mira heard a muffled conversation in the background. Prepare the vessel for towing. Roland will be with you in an hour. I'd be grateful if you could update me on the contents of the hold. I need to know exactly what we're bringing on board. Affirmative, Captain. We'll check it out. Mira swiveled the command chair. Tate was still trying to bring the vessel systems online and was busy checking fuses and reinserting them into their carriers. Barnes appeared in the doorway. She told them the captain had agreed to take the Kobo onto the Berlin. Barnes sighed. Huh. Probably for the best. She's taken a beating and we can't really be sure how sound the hull is. I guess we checked the lower decks and shut the reactor down, she said, sliding out of the command seat. Looks like you were getting comfortable, Barnes said. I was. It had been a long time since she had sat in the pilot seat, and Mira was disappointed that the ship was immobile. She yearned for the chance to take the stick one more time. Come on, Rich. Let's take a look down below. Ethan, I want you to bring the core functions online. Give priority to the shields. Roland lacks a delicate touch with his towing rig. Yes, ma'am, he said without looking up. Mira and Barnes walked aft. When they reached the stairwell, Barnes hit the door mechanism. The door did not respond. Security locked. Damn it. He reached for his comlink. Hey man, it's Barnes. Can you override the security systems? There was a pause. A light on the door lit green. Barnes hit the control and the door slid up. Kid's good, Mira said. Top of his class in engineering. I have no idea why he enlisted. He'd be a good fit for the fleet. He ushered Mira through the door. Mira did her best to conceal her surprise. She had known the big man for ten years, and the Marine Corps was everything to him. There were Marines, and then there was everyone else. Before they entered the stairwell, Barnes stopped Mira. He blocked her path. You okay, he asked. I saw you popping pills on the way over. It's not the first time either. Mira smiled. I'm fine, Gunny. Just a headache. Standard issued painkillers. He didn't look satisfied with the answer. Mira, you need the doctor to check you out. Rich, I'm fine. My sickness level is already too high. I don't want to be grounded and it's getting to where Monica will have to report me. I don't want to put her in that position. Barnes shook his head. You know she'd never do that. Mira did. Dr. Monica Garrett was one of her closest friends. Correction, one of her only friends. It still did not sit easy with her. Okay, when we get back, I'll get her to check me out. It was a lie. Mira suspected Barnes knew it too but he let it go. Come on, Gunny. Let's see what's down here. She drew her sidearm and activated the barrel light. It cut through the darkness of the stairwell. Barnes followed behind. As they descended, the light level increased as the corridor curved around the central hold. After 10 meters, they came across the entrance to the cargo area. It was a large hatchway, recessed into the bulkhead. Opposite of the hold was a similarly sized airlock entrance. Barnes tried the door control. It beeped, but the hold did not open. He called Tate. Mira couldn't hear the exchange. Barnes just shook his head. He can't open it. It uses deep encryption, Barnes says. He's trying to access the security system to get a visual of whatever is in there. Okay, let's move on. I'll take a look at engineering with you, and then secure the upper deck. We'll be turning the gravity off, and I don't want the contents of an unflushed toilet floating around. Barnes laughed and led the way. They kept their weapons ready but any real intent was lost. So why don't you go home, Mira? Barnes asked. What? You have family back home. You're a veteran and have a pension waiting for you. So why not? Mira didn't know how to answer. Barnes was right. There were many officers in her position who had cashed in their commission for easy lives in the core systems. Rich, after the crash, I was going to do just that, but with all the shit that followed, I need the distance. Besides, I can't cook, and the Navy feeds me. Barnes laughed. It was measured. Mira could see something in his eyes. It wasn't the normal pity she was used to seeing from those who knew her past. It was sadness. She nudged him gently with affection. Don't worry, Rich. I'm getting my shit together. They walked on in silence. The door to the engineering section was unlocked and opened without aid from Tate. The compartment was filled with thick gray smoke. 
Mira recoiled as the acrid fumes hit the back of her throat. Her visor automatically lowered, and she purged the fumes from her respiration system. Taking a moment to breathe the pure Nidox mix, she waited for the feeling of nausea to pass. She had puked in a helmet once, and once was enough. Is there a fire? she screamed. No, the automated system has taken care of it. The air scrubbers are out. The smoke has nowhere to go, Barnes said. Mira felt her feet slipping on the floor. She glanced down to see it was covered in plastifoam. The extinguishers had done their job and put the fire out, but the remnants posed an equally serious risk. Barnes disappeared into the cloud of blue-gray smoke, and seconds later it vented away, leaving the compartment clear. Mira checked the air quality. It was poor, but breathable, so she opened her helmet. The smell of combustion still lingered in the air. Plasma leak, she said. The smell was distinctive, a smell of rotting fish. Barnes nodded, then laughed. Your face when you walked in, I thought you were going to lose it. Think yourself lucky I didn't have breakfast, otherwise I would have. Mira looked around the room. The extinguishing covered every surface. The consoles were scorched, but appeared to be functional. She could see the damage that had caused the flash fire. Broken tubing and burnt cable still smoldered at the far end of the compartment. The plasma feed inductors were badly damaged. Without them, the ship had no sublight propulsion or hyperdrive. Barnes was looking at the readout on the data screen. He confirmed her suspicions. This is just one big lump of scrap. The reactor is offline and we're running on batteries, he said. I could take care of it down here if you want to go up topside and see if Private Tate can break into the security system. Okay, thanks, Gunny. She turned and left. The stink of the burnt plasma seemed to follow her up the corridor. Roman Vincent watched the tug approach his dead fighter, growing from a tiny moving speck of light into an ugly slab of metal and girders. His ship was spinning lazily on its central axis. The drive system had dropped into a fail state, and all but life support was functioning. He felt a shudder run through the hull as the towing harness was attached to his freighter. The tug began to move away, pulling the smaller ship behind it. Romain slapped the bulkhead with his fist. It was his third intercept with this crew. Why did they have to take this job? The past four years of his life had been spent working for Xander Rhodes as one of the legendary blades, the scourge of the frontier. Roach turned out to be a prick, a hollow echo of the stories told about him. There were plenty of raids, plenty of liberated cargo, yet Romaine hadn't seen anything more than a basic wage. When a new crew, young with big dreams, had approached him with an offer a big payday for a small job, he had signed on willingly. Only now he realized he had signed his life away. Once aboard the Navy ship, he would be taken to the nearest outpost, processed through the system, and sentenced to a prison facility in some colonial backwater. Unlike Eden and Freddy, who had shown their true colors and jumped away, he had no opportunity to amass a fortune that would be awaiting for him on release. All he could do was sit in his cockpit and watch as he drew closer to the naval vessel in a very certain future. As the enormity of the situation dawned on him, he shivered. His stomach churned into a knot. Fuck you, Rhodes. Fuck you, Eden. And fuck you, Freddy. An idea began to form. The dead man's hand. He might just be able to bring his jump drive online long enough to leap away. Half a light year in any direction would be enough. Romain cycled through the ship's manual on his knee-mounted data pad. The fighter's cannon used a particle accelerator to generate energy. If he were to force an overload, then the warship's sensors would detect an energy spike. It would appear to them as if the ship were about to explode, which it would if he wasn't able to dump the excess energy. Normally, he would have to vent heat and plasma into space. If he could root it into the drive subsystem, he might be able to kickstart the FTL drive. It was an old trick, often spoken of in seedy frontier bars and Uninet chat rooms. It was a gamble. The odds were against him, but Romain had always been a man to play the long odds. The tug moved on to an approach vector for the cruiser's docking bay. As it did so, Romain switched his weapon system into maintenance mode and set off a chain of commands that would cause the plasma accelerator to feedback. Warnings flashed on his HUD. He overrode them and waited. They were entering the bay now. Romain felt a trickle of cold sweat running down the back of his neck. The plan began to unfold as the tug engaged reverse thrust and pushed back, disengaging the towing bar as it did so. 
Romain was now moving backwards relative to the cruiser. He entered an override code to halt the reaction, using his last residual power to flip the ship into an escape vector. The weapon system did not respond. Frantically, he retyped the override instruction. The temperature was now critical, a chain reaction beginning to run out of control. Three seconds later, Romain Vincent's short career as a hired gun ended in an expanding ball of exotic energy and hard gamma radiation. What has happened to the FSS Berlin? Our Mira and her team stranded on this out of commission freighter. Ark of Souls is available for purchase on Amazon. Tune in next week when we review the reviews left for this book and speak to the author about the topic of world building. Now for the story lover portion of the podcast. This is the part where you, the listener, becomes part of the program. Your reviews not only let authors know how you've reacted to their work, but also helps them grow as an artist. Also, you may find yourself on next week's episode. Leave a review for this tale at acnbooks.com backslash indie beginning or on any of our social media pages using the hashtag indie beginning review. Want to be heard? Send a recorded review to reviews.indiebeginning at gmail.com. We'd even love for you to rate us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or Stitcher. If you are an indie author and would like to hear your work featured on Indie Beginning, go to acnbooks.com backslash submit. Music found in this week's episode was written and performed by Swelling, and comes from the album Projector Music for Visual Media. I am your host, Benjamin Frankie, asking everyone to read more books, be the best possible you, and to simply enjoy this wonderful life. Thanks for listening.